and welcome to episode 5 of my harp ornamentation series. My name is Karen Marshallsey and I'm a traditional musician from Scotland and I've been sharing with you ways of playing ornamentation, grace notes and decoration on the harp, on any harp. To be entirely honest, we've had clips from pedal harps, modern levered classics, wirestorm harps. I might even bring the bray harp out, not this week, but maybe next week. You never know. So we've looked through quite a lot of things. Uh, we've looked at individual techniques like cuts or ways of articulating, stopping off the notes, so thumb chokes, short plaits, half scratches, these sort of things. We've looked at ways of playing repeated notes uh, as a bees plat or a burl if you like, or a triplet, a favourite of mine, the beat. And we've also looked at what I call gurglies, a sort of two-handed composite decoration. So that's not an exhaustive list by any manner of means. It's probably my most commonly used decoration techniques, but it's certainly not an exhaustive list. There, there, are, there are more. But what I'd like to do this week is to actually take a tune from the beginning. I know we've looked at bits of tunes, but we've looked at them with the view of learning and particularly practicing one or two particular movements. This time I'm going to take a tune from the start that I probably, well it's a tune that I've not heard anyone else ever play to be entirely honest. I found it in the Angus Fraser collection of Scottish Gaelic Airs. Uh, it's, it's the fourth tune in the collection actually on page seven if you have Tyna Teach's modern reprint. Orin and Splogs and Fearin, the song of truths and hyperboles. We don't know very much about the piece. The notes at the back say that the air of this curious old song in 48 stanzas, one half of which conveyed truths to which the mind readily attested, and the other half consisted of the most outrageous and incredible fictions ever invented. This air is from the singing of MacLennan, the Loch Broom Bard. And that comes from notes that were in the second volume. There are notes to some of these tunes in the manuscript of the second volume of the Simon Fraser collection is what that's referring to. There's a wealth of material in here, so it's just one of the, the many collections that you can use as a resource of tunes. So let's just have a listen to this tune. We're not given any other information about it other than that. That's, that's what we have. So what I'm bringing to it, I suppose, is all my years of experience as a traditional musician, uh, listening to to piper, pipers, fiddlers, singers, working on the harp, working with all these great musicians. So my approach is what I'm going to show you. And the first thing I would do is just get really familiar and comfortable with the tune itself. So let's just do that now. So I'm going to go through I'm just going to play the tune through as it appears in the manuscript without any decoration.
So that's the tune itself. As it appears, I think I said in the manuscript, I've not seen the manuscript myself, I must go and visit it one day and see what the tunes are like in the original handwriting. This is in the, as it appears in the, the modern reprinted version. So at the minute, I'm not too concerned about exactly how I, how I finger the notes. I am paying attention to phrases as I'm playing through, I'm noting what are the phrases, where do they lie. Uh, they're quite clearly marked because you have that little semi-quaver rest and then a little shorter pick up note before the start of the next phrase. So that's, it's a good tune to do for that. But I am paying attention to where my fingers might naturally want to go. But at the same time, I know that I'm going to be adding in decorations, which will very probably change some of that fingering. So the important thing at the minute is to get the tune in your head and the notes under your fingers. I don't think there's anything particularly difficult about it. I'll just go through the phrases. I'm going to keep it at a nice air like pace. Uh, it could go a little bit faster, but I know, and it maybe seems very, very slow at the minute, but I know that there's going to be a lot of decoration added into this piece. So that, that's the speed that I'm hearing it at in my head. Of, of long and shorter notes. And the pick up to the next phrase is shorter again, semi quaver. So if you're counting it, you've got note by note or phrase by phrase you can pause and rewind the video you can also download the sheet music which uh, there is a small charge for just to help me offset the cost of making these resources available to anyone so it'd be great if you could do that I'll pop the link down in the chat but I'm now going to start looking at the first places that I might put some grace notes in and the first thing that I find I would do would probably be to add a cut in and it gives a nice uh, flow to the, to the notes. It should just flow nicely. And it also is a way of adding in a few decorations without making a piece too complicated. So it's a good elementary sort of beginner's level thing to do. So let's just look at a couple of places where I might do that. It's quite nice to make a, just a strong opening statement without anything and then cut down here. That would be nice. So that becomes. And I'm going to do it there 
it again as well, almost as a little echo of that first phrase. You do need to be careful that you don't fall into the, the trap, if you like, of always placing cuts at the first note of every phrase or the, the, the first part of each bar or something like that. So just, just watch yourself. It can, I find with cuts it can be a little bit too easy just to fall into putting them in the same place all the time. But I like the, the echoing nature of that. phrase I've put my cut up at the top and I'm going to go down G to E So for that last phrase, I've just done a little cut B up to C. And this is where exactly when you put your fingers back on the strings is quite important because you're playing the notes are going B, C, back to the B, ending on the E. So if I play that B as a melody note, and then as a cut, my finger's got to come back onto it anyway because I'm going to play it again as the next note. So if I do something like that and bring my finger on very quickly, it just gives a really nice effect and it makes the C really clean. And that, that would be a lovely way of just playing the tune itself with a couple of grace notes. level or first time through. I might just do a little cut. I'm playing tune note, tune note, so I've got the long tune note, the shorter tune note and then an even shorter grace note cutting up to the A. And you could do it on the second phrase, second part of the phrase, A to C. Could leave the first part of the second, free, second phrase bare, if you like, and just do that little cut down again, which again is echoing. something slightly different. I've moved the grace note. You are still hearing three E's, long melody note, then a little grace note which I'm playing with my third before my second comes on to play the shorter melody note. So I'm playing it as a three two if you like. And then we're coming down for our last phrase. nice place to bring in a turn. We've come down the D was the pick up and we're coming down B A G A B C A. So it'd be nice to play around one of those notes. Playing them notes as melody notes, going back to play them again as grace notes. 
again, I always stamp out the middle of that uh, run of three, three notes. down there at the end if you like. That would be another way of doing it if you didn't want to do a turn you just wanted to do a cut but I actually prefer the turn round. Turning round the A and it's a narrow turn because you're just going to the adjacent strings. And if you want to cut down the C to the E there you can. So let's have a look at that. Just adding in a few simple cuts, eh, a little turn, a couple, a little three, two. You're already enhancing the tune, and if you're leaving these grace notes ringing, that's starting to add in harmony and starting to suggest harmony. There's a ringing that's going on. just from the, the strings that I've played. So let's have a look at what you might put in to add in with your left hand at this stage because you do want to think about what sort of chord you're on if you like at any point. So at this point my left hand is just going to fill in a little bit of support if you like. So I'm just going to play an A and an E, just, so just a nice open A minor, a fifth. And I'm just going to do that. I've got that E minor chord ringing out there, that triad, just from the tune, so I'm just going to add in a beat in the E here. And it's quite nice because that E is shared between both fingers so you've got to uh, decide exactly when your right hand is coming on to it. It's nice to bring it on a little bit in advance just to give you again a little bit of punctuation. So I've played an A minor and then an E minor. I'm now going to go back to the A minor but I'm going to go down the octave on a big harp just to bring in the, the low strings. moved up to the B and the E. Single notes are perfectly fine and can really be effective in just uh, highlighting, illustrating particular points of the tune. This is what we've done. very open with a fifth. On a harp like this I would maybe move up to the triad and roll it. E and a B. Going to the G and the D. Now you can hear there I just played two A minor open fifths. But there's a different effect in the way I've played each one of them. I don't want to go too much into arranging because that, that isn't really what these workshops are about. They're really about the ornamentation, but just because it's all part of the same thing. Uh, you don't want to think about it as a left hand. That's something that you've got to make all really difficult and clever and do lots of technical things and lots of runs and I have to do all this and I need a tune to 
marry that on top. Quite often you hear it's as if the two hands are fighting each other, you know, that the, the tune is dominant, the tune is the important thing. That's the reason you're playing this piece of music, is you're playing the tune. And everything else is just supporting that, decorating it and supporting it. So you do need to think about the two of them together, but don't don't let that left hand get too too dominant. But what I did there was just, I played it straight the first time, and then I simply just spread the two notes out slightly. So the first time, you can always think of that as I'm cutting my left hand up. Because that's really what you're doing. If you start writing it down like that, it starts getting quite confusing and quite a little bit cluttered. You know, the sheet music can be cluttered at times if you try to note, notate absolutely everything that's happening. But just be aware of these nuances. It might be that you 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 learn the tune, you learn the grace notes, you, you learn what the chords are and things. And it's only once you've really got the tune flowing that you, you maybe hear the difference in your own playing between straight and then slightly rolled. But that's absolutely fine, that's, that's the way it works. So, onto the, the B part. I'm thinking of moving from an E minor to an A minor to a C and then back to an A minor if you want to think about it that way. But I'm just doing it by playing single notes. So I'm coming up from the E to the A to the C to the E. Now, it's possible to finger that with all four fingers if you want to, but you know there's plenty of time to move and I think if you place that all in advance there's a tendency to speed up because your your left hand wants to wants to play all these notes. You don't want that sort of impetus to just keep gathering and, and run away with you. you. You do have to pull back on the, the speed at times and watch yourself because you generally are playing faster than you think you are that's something to remember as well especially on faster tunes you, you often are playing faster than you actually think you are so just put the brakes on a little bit and it is quite hard on a harp because you're not doing anything in between the notes whereas on instruments that you're actually still creating the sound if you're on a flute or a fiddle or something like that or you're singing you're still creating that sound but once you've played these notes you know you've done it your hands just have to hold back and curb themselves from going back on too quickly unless you actually do want to go on and stop it because that is all you can do once you've played the note the only thing you can do is stop it or just move on to the next note so i would play them in groups of two and one me more control over the sound that I want as well as the speed. So I'm just going to an open fifth on the C. Going to an E, an e I'm calling these C and E minor but remember I'm not really playing that third at all, I'm just omitting it because that's the, the traditional sound, that's the more open sound that, that Scottish music really, really needs. And I'm going to repeat the same left hand even though I've changed the grace notes slightly. Back to the E, so an E and B here. And I'm going to play a B and an E. for you.
and that would be absolutely fine if you want if that's your stage of playing that you're at just just concentrate on that and the beauty of these tunes and of this way of playing is that tunes can go with you all your life all your playing life a tune like this you could even just you might not even be at that stage you might be wanting to play it and use both your hands to play the tune that is all perfectly fine and good to do the important thing is to play the tune remember the harps sort of the odd the odd one out in the traditional instruments and that we do have all this uh, chordal left hand possibilities so yeah <clears throat> that's absolutely fine you could play the tune two or three times round like that you might find, as you get familiar with it, that where you want to put the grace notes start changing slightly, and that, that's great. That's when you know that you're really putting, you're really making the tune your own. So let's look at another couple of possibilities that you might want to do. So we had, to the second time not the first time but if you're going around to the tune the second time and that's uh, just trying things out and seeing what happens so I need to go back and watch the video to put all that down in the music for you but running up that little finger plat is a really nice thing to do I wouldn't do it to start the tune because I would want to, that phrase to be stated quite boldly at the very beginning but the second or third time round yes I might well do that remember if you don't know a little finger plat Please go back and watch some of the previous videos. It was maybe episode two, I think, that did that one. The main benefit is if I do that, everything's ringing. It's just more delicate. Uh, so you could do that. You could cut, but instead of always cutting onto that first note, first time round you could cut there cutting the last one doesn't work quite as well for me and this is the process you have to think about it okay where could I put cuts try them all out and, and listen and really trust your ear just does it sound right it's not very scientific, I'm afraid. There is no magic formula or equation that you can learn where grace notes should be. You just have to listen to lots of music and, and listen to the style and then trust your judgment. So we've done. Something along those lines. want to cut up and down. And it's also nice not to have grace notes in too many places. You can overdo them as well. You can just have them all over the place and it just, you start losing the tune. You mustn't lose the tune. The tune is so important. You cannot lose the tune. And remember, your, your listeners should be aware of the grace notes. Uh, they're, they're doing a job of work. They're expressing emotion in the tune. They're highlighting the tune. They're acting as dynamics as well, as well as leaving you a shimmering harmony. So they should be aware of them, 
but they should never be overpowering and they should never be left wondering, hmm, what's the tune? Is, is that grace note or is that tune notes or, or what's happening there? That's just you, the player has not conveyed the tune properly, which is not what we want to happen. The B part, these low notes and repeated notes. We've played a cut. Done a three two. It's really crying out to do a B splat, isn't it? A four three two there. And then you might add a little cut down. What would be really nice would be to do that as a thumb choke. It's just cleaner. You're, you're evoking a bagpiping feel with these. So I think a cleaner sound than grace note would be very appropriate there. Could do a little turn there. One thing you can do, cross over, your left hand can come up high and you could actually just uh, repeat that A to the G. Just adds another little something, another little bit of decoration. You can even put a cut into your right hand. I wouldn't cut both hands, you don't really need it. So your right hand is probably more used to doing them, so let's keep it in there. Too, because it's nice and strong and you can you can build it I find this this phrase this ending phrase of the B part it's beautiful but it's a little bit unexpected the more expected thing would be to end it the same way we ended the first part of the tune but I think it's more beautiful for this so you can almost highlight it by doing very little if you like Just the same little cut down that we did in the simpler version or you could do something here you could do that just cutting down from the D to the B I find a turn in there would just be a little bit too much I think probably do that adding another little cut I think I would just do that if I was wanting anything extra going on so let's have a little look at what I might do in my left hand for that second time round the tune where we've added in a few more grace notes another another layer if you like in the same way that I don't play my grace notes in the same place all the time, I don't do the same left hand all the time either. And that's what makes the music exciting and in the moment for me and what a deep interest. I don't know exactly what I'm going to play. So it's different every time. It's alive every time. It's, it's never becomes like some sort of rote exercise that, that someone's playing. So you don't have to do that. Uh, but that's partly explaining why I might not be playing exactly the same thing all the time. But I certainly would want to change uh, from the first time round to the second time round. And again, 
In the same way that I've expanded the grace notes a little, I'm just expanding my left hand a little, but also your left hand, if you're changing the grace notes, then your left hand is going to have to change as well because the, the two should be working together, remember. You don't want the two hands fighting against each other. And if I'm doing something really nice and interesting, like that lovely little, little finger plat running up, I don't want a big heavy, big overpowering, stonking left hand thing stomping all over my nice little delicate grace note. That's, that, that would just stand out like a sore thumb to be entirely honest. So I want something nice and delicate. And I'm going to think of it as a little echo. So I'm coming in slightly after. And you could leave that. That would be very nice. Space is important as well. Things don't have to be, you don't have to be playing all the time. Resist that urge to keep playing notes and let, let the music breathe, let the tune breathe. So, this time I'm almost thinking of the left hand playing a grace note to the right hand. I've written it out as a single note, obviously, because you don't want to clutter the music with, with too many ties and grace notes and all sorts of things. But in my head, I'm dec that, that note is decorating this one. Just do something as simple as that. The A and the E that's there, just moving up to the B and the E. My A is still ringing and I'm quite happy with that because it's almost like a drone that I'm playing over. And if I do cut down there, I'm not going to add in anything else. But everything's been up here quite a lot, so I'm going to go down the harp. in a little bit of tension. Moving down the harp, bringing in these low strings, and it's the first time we've really done a nice full chord. Again, this isn't really the, the, the topic, we're not really talking about arranging, but we're, we're talking about ornamentation, we're not really talking chords and voicings, but just in passing, I'm not playing that third in the chord. I'm playing octaves with the fifth in the middle. And that's what I think of as my basic chord. The third just is too, too full. It, it muddies the waters a bit too much. It makes it a bit too sweet at times in a major chord. You could go downwards if you want to. need for that here it's just it's a lighter moment we've gone to the major so I'm just going to roll it up the way I might do that if I'm doing I give you a couple of options here if I'm doing the I'm just in there you never know there's 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 options I think the other option I gave you was I might do something like that just rolling an octave with a fifth and middle E minor chord happening here so it might just be yeah I like that there I didn't particularly like it when I hit that low one so I'm going to go G and D here now at one point I gave you the option of doing a beat here and 
then a little run down. If you, again, if you're doing a beat, it's like I said at the very start of this version, left hand, if you're doing something interesting here, don't clutter up too much. I would just do something along those lines. If you didn't want to do the beat, I might actually then mirror the tune notes an octave lower. Again, I just I feel feel the need to put something in that space. So that's the, the two things that I would probably go for. For the B part, we've got nine nice B's plaques, four, three, two, triplets happening. So I really just want strength. So we're going. Something along those lines. I have put the fifth in on the first one. I've put that B in. You could just make them all octaves if you want. But having that B in there. Just gone to a fifth. I'm going to roll my C. And it's nice to have a little echo as I think of these offbeat notes. spoke about what the left hand's doing there. I'm just trying to add a little bit, a little bit of build, a little bit of drama. So I've what I call bouncing the chord, playing the bass note first and then the top of the chord together. And then doing the similar thing, playing my low octave first. together. Just build a bit of drama. And then we did was one option or we just decided to leave it bare. Well there was a halfway house. and then just ending up on an A. Now we've just done this strong. E to B. You might want to do something like that. So that was just B to E and ending with a harmonic. I'm going to do an episode where I'll talk a little bit about adding bits and pieces of colour and you might notice that I play harmonics two different ways and it's just to get the sound that I want but we'll talk about that in a further episode. So yeah, a harmonic's quite nice there to bring it down, make it nice and nice and light. So let's move on to a third version. And what could we do if, if we want? You don't have to play all of these. Don't look at a piece of music or don't look at the sheet music and say, oh, but I can't play that stuff at the end, that third version. It's too complicated. I need to leave the whole thing till another six months till I can play that. Just, just play what you can. And I might have said this before in one of the episodes, but the, the beauty of learning, the way, the way I, I, I did a lot of my learning here in Scotland was in mixed groups. So you were hearing what other players who were more advanced than you were adding in and what they were doing and how that made that sound. So your fingers maybe couldn't do it yet and maybe your brain couldn't cope with it, but you were still learning. You were learning what, what was appropriate and where these grace notes would go. So don't switch off at this point, even if you think it is a little bit beyond what you can do at the minute, because you will absorb it and you will, it'll be there when your fingers are ready to play it. So. This is now the third time round the tune and I, I want to I want to pack a bit more into it. So I'm going to mix some of my two-handed gurglies in with just some other grace notes. So I'm going to do something like this. For 
my first two for my for my first freeze, those first two bars. So this is this is the, the gurgly. Now you could play it a couple of different ways. I'm thinking of as being my tune notes at this point. These are the notes I've chosen to pick out the tune and, and highlight and then decorate. And I'm coming down. And then, so you could do it this way, but, and I, I think I possibly have even done that when I first started playing it. Now I actually prefer to take this with my right. So I'm coming down C, E, A. I've not played the melody note yet. This is the melody note I'm going to go back to. I'm coming down. So I've run of five grace notes. One, two, three. before the melody note which is coming on the beat so if you haven't watched episode four which had all about gurglies then please go back and have a look at that and have a look at that sheet music as well for episode four and you'll understand what on earth I'm doing here so so this is just a standard gurgly we're moving on to and then I'm pulling it in slightly and I'm going to cut down and I'm going to double the melody, an octave lower. Start off the same way. Same thing, doubling the melody notes. Another little gurgle. And this time, it's the same rhythm, but it's slightly different notes because I'm doing octave e, uh, I'm doing octave E's. So I'm now going to cut up to this C, and then I'm going to do a gurgle on the second C. Four, three, two, B flat up to the G. Cut down G to E. So I've played. I've got a bit more space to put in a left hand here. So you could do a little bit more. You could do octave C's going downwards. Then this time it's a C, but it's an inversion. So I'm highlighting the E at the base of the chord. You could play a single note E there. You could play it up at the top to give a different sound. That's another bit of colour that we're going to talk about. Or you could do a harmonic. So we've done... We're going back to our E minor over the B. So we're coming down. as before and playing this G in between the two melody notes. What's its role? It's doing lots of things. It's yes it's providing support, chordal support down there, it's filling it in, everything's been it's very light. I want to anchor it more in a G chord sound down here so I'm going down to that but I'm also playing it in between the two melody notes so it's kind of decorating this G. in so that it's, it's really an A minor but it's over an E. Turn around that B. Again I'm doing a lot of doubling melody notes an octave lower. So let's just recap what we've done there.
on to the B part. Keeping these 4-3-2s because they're, they're such good fun. Uh, but it, we've moved to a, an E minor, so I'm moving down to do my gurgly here. Now I'm going to go to octaves. I'm going to carry on with my doubling the melody there. So we have our gurgly. If you could do, instead of doubling, which is a nice strong thing, you might feel I don't want to be so strong there, I've been strong down here, I want to pull back a bit. Remember we had that nice thumb choke, so you could do We had that before. Now you could do the same thing, or you could just alter it, just vary it for the for the sake of varying it, really, and not. You don't want your your listener to get too comfortable. I mean, yes, you want them to enjoy what you're doing, but. You don't want them to expect the same thing over and over again. And we've already done the octave, so let's just break the pattern a little bit. Breaking patterns is always really good. So I'm just going to go down to an E and an E. C and an E. And then octave E's. Gurgle, which is really just around this triad. This is where a downward chord is going to work really well in this piece. And it works there as well on the A minor. So that becomes... To, what are you going to do after that? You might just think, oh, I've got through it. I'm just going to stop it on these really dramatic downward chords and that's grand. You might feel, yeah, this is going really nice. I'm going to just pull back. So as you build up, you're going to pull back. You might want to strip it back and just play. You could almost go backwards, play the, the second version and then end up with the first version. Or you could pare it down. You could do something like just playing the melody up the octave with very simple underneath. Something like that would be very effective. So, still got choices. Okay, I'll try and play through all those things I've spoken about, but might come out slightly differently. Thank you. 
strong harp here now and I'm just going to have another look at the same tune on this harp. Don't switch off if you are, please don't switch off. Uh, you are obviously free to do what you wish but I think you'll find it interesting and useful and it will make sense of a lot of what I'm saying I hope about the ringing nature of grace notes. If you do watch this as well, even though you don't play a wire, you might not have any inclination or desire to play a wire harp, that's absolutely fine. One of the things that I'm quite keen on is to try and dispel the myth that you either play wire or you play gut and that they're two completely separate things and, you know, you, you, you can only do this on wire or these are wire techniques and, and all the rest of it. They're harps, they're harp techniques. And there's a lot that even if you just play a gut strung clarser or if you're playing this music on pedal harp or any instrument that you're playing, I think there are things to be learnt from going over the tune on a wire strung harp. So, likewise, if you're a wire strung player, I hope you haven't just jumped to this point. I haven't actually said exactly when this will start. So, hopefully, You've been listening to the previous versions on gut, so you now know the tune, you, you've got an idea of where the grace notes are working and you should hopefully have an idea now of, oh, how this would work, what you might do on a wire strum harp. So I'll just go back through the tune again. Same as before, I'm not thinking about fingering at the minute. I am, as I'm playing through the tune, thinking about notes that I want to automatically damp and get rid of, but really just getting the tune in my head. If you're really paying attention, you'll realise that there's a little bit of a wonder, the little variation phrase there uh, in the second part. And what I didn't do was panic and stop. What you do is you just, oh, that's interesting, keep going. Uh, sometimes when that happens, that, that's how you get ideas for little 
differences, free little variations in the phrases. And that's one of the things we're going to talk about in the next episode is, is doing sort of tune variations, little, whether it's just a variation of a tiny phrase or the variation of a part or whatever. I'm not going to tell you what I did wrong. I did that wasn't this actual tune notes, but I'm just going to play it right this time, hopefully. have a lot more sustain. I am damping some things out. If I didn't, you would get... And it, it would just sound like a horrible mush of everything. So I am just doing some automatic damping there. But I still want to think about what I want to do in terms of ornamentation. It's very similar to what I did the first time round. I might do a cut the same way I did before. I wanted that C and that B to clash. But I'm more likely to do it by playing a thumb choke. Same effect. to leave ringing as a cut. I like that shimmer. And that sounds a little bit too broken from what I want at the minute if I was to do a fork choke there. And that would be a short plait. I do feel that on a wire heart I would put that turn in there. And I might not do that cut there because I don't feel the need to do the echo effect that I talked about on the gut heart between the phrases. So I'd probably do I might do that. I might leave it ringing. I might go for a cleaner version. And I'm not really going to be doing very much my left hand. follow these same notes. It looks a little bit different just because I'm anchoring my fingers on the strings. I might go to my low C and the G. on the gut heart I was playing an E and a B. I've just done that C and G. I, I, 
think I want to move the timbre away from down there. So. I'm going to move up to here, to the B and the E. And I'm going to stay in that B and that E. For wire players as well, I'm doing a lot of just with having these anchored fingers up, that was B and E. And my third's going back onto it to damp it as I, my fourth plays the E. It's really worth practicing these sort of damping bracket three, uh, an Anne Heyman term. It's a good little exercise for practicing something like that. Let's have a look at the second, slightly fuller arrangement. See if the same sort of things are working. That works fine. That's really nice. There's a little bit of emphasis on the wire to that C. And I would leave that cutting B to G down just to ring out. just fingering wise. Might do a beat. That would be really nice. I probably wouldn't do it the second time round. I might do that maybe a third or fourth or something. That would be two beats. I'm just flinging all sorts of ideas at you and I'm not staring at a, a scripted score or anything. So uh, let's just recap what we were doing there. Possibly a beat. Possibly two beats. to ring. I would probably short plat over a third. Your fingers are now in place to do a fork choke on the way down. But if you want a little bit more ring than that, you might let the second one just ring out as a cut. Also the option of doing a little turn there as well, didn't we, on the gut harp? That's nice. I would definitely damp out that middle note with my thumb though, because it's just ringing a bit too much. I really hear the beat here in a wire. And I'm just going to keep supporting that a little bit. The same principles apply. I That's quite delicate, so I'm not going to come in anything at the same time. I might do something like that, just echoes down to the E. thinking there if I was playing that I was going to tell you something. Uh, same thing, I'm 
damping out. The E is the same, so it's the A and the B that's switching as your lower note. So. That's quite a strong on the wire, so I probably wouldn't do the cut down there. I think it's a bit superfluous. I might do that. I've got my lowest string here tuned up as an A drone, so it might be quite nice on the wire. Often about this point in the tune, I'll go down to bring that low drone in. Again, because I'm rolling both of these on the wire, that's taking up that, so it's doing that sort of decoration thing for me. I might do a thumb choke. But with the low note, I don't think I would. So I'm going to settle on something like this. to go to the B there. You can absolutely can roll a great big chord like that. Octaves in the fifth, same as before. All I've done is I've touched out that low E because I don't want any minor effects happening there. So that A was ringing because we've just done... And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm not going to do a second note there on this harp because it is not needed. I also don't have it on this harp. Maybe if you're on a bigger wire harp, I don't know, I would need to try. I think this is sustaining enough, so I'm not going to try and do an extra C there. I'm not going to do a, a triad there on a wire harp. I just don't think it would work. That's you're in a different sound world, you're not in an ancient, you're not in a Scottish traditional or an ancient sounding Scottish uh, world there at all with that triad. So it worked fine in the gut, this is where if you played different harps you've really got to, got to listen to the harps and the sounds, the sounds are different so exactly how you express things will be slightly different as well but not as different as everybody seems to, seems to think. So I'm just rocking them, if you like, playing the low C then up to the G. And I don't really feel the need for any kind of harmonic or anything else. My C and my G are just ringing out nicely. Or, if you want to do that. Then we've got an E, B, E. Go into the G and the D. I would play the beat here, so I wouldn't have anything in my left hand. But I would probably double that C. A and E, or... It's quite nice to go down with the E on the bass, because we're going into this second part that's playing around these low E's. So, let's have a look at the second part. exactly what I did in the gut harp and it just works absolutely fine. What I don't have is the same amount of strings. You could sometimes you, you move up the octave if you want to do this in a smaller harp. But that's not what I want to do at the minute. Uh, I would tend to move up the octave fourth or fifth time around at a small tune but I don't want to do it at the minute. So I'm sharing this, this E note, so I'm just going to play E and B here. And because I've tuned my low drone to an A, I'm going to go to the A. The C. 
and I'm going to do that D thumb choke. I am going to get rid of that B if any wired people are paying attention here. I'm playing the fifth E and the B to begin with, going to A octaves and back hopping my thumb up to touch that B out. Octave C's. You can do what we did there on the gut harp if you like, which was an A and an E, but to be honest, that whole A minor chord feel is ringing out because I got rid of the B. And I just think that puts a little bit more emphasis there, so I'm just missing that chord out. that we did before. If you don't like doing it, I have come across quite a few players on wire who just never ever do these rolled chords, you could maybe bounce it. I can go down to that low A because I've tuned it in. But you could just roll it. I am damping out the C just because it's, it's the next string up and I want a little bit of extra clarity onto that A. So... Remember here we were doing, I would do it as two thumb chokes on a wire harp. I would do B and E as before. So I would roll this chord, the way you're damping the C out, B and E, and just two thumb chokes in the A and the B, A and the G. You do the same thing as before, you can stagger your notes, you're playing the lower one first. And come together. So a couple of hands octaves, you want to think about it that way. Straight E, B, E, I'm coming up. Doing a fart choke. You can stagger them in between. Or that G and E together is actually really nice. Again, I wouldn't do the harmonic, I would just do the same thing as before, the B to the E. Dab the B out, play my A, it's absolutely fine to let that E ring. So that leaves us with this A3 and B3, the third time round where I put in these gurgly variations along with grace notes. So, on a wire, Absolutely fine, doesn't it? Same thing. I might just pull back a little bit. I had octave E's on the bass there. Obviously, I don't have them in this harp. Uh, so I've just done the, the gurgle on the A. Just done the gurgle on the A. You can either focus on the extra little cut there and play the E at the end or or take the cut out and just double the melody. No way. And the gut so in the gut heart we had Sounds like it's going to work fine on wire to me. Just keep those octaves as well. Now 
in the gut I had. I find that middle G and C together a little bit heavy, so I might just go E to C. And do a little echo E there. Exactly the same as what I've done before. There's very little changes happening here, which is why it's really good if you watch the whole video and don't just zoom in and, oh, I want the gut harp or the wire harp. So, the second part. Exactly the same as what I did before. Third place on the E. B's plat. Octaves on the A, octaves on the C, and I'm just doubling a thumb chop with both hands. Carrying on. Now the only question here really is, do you want to do that grace note there? And I'm, I would play about with it. The, this E minor over B gurgle is exactly the same. The question is, do you want to do E right? Or do you want to just do It's your choice. Go back to our Instead of doing uh, after this gurgle, I've played the low A to E. I've moved this next one up the octave. You could actually do that, which would be really nice. My play my top E. I think I would do this on a wire. Sounding good. Back to our E minor over B gurgle. Downward chords are great on the wire. The only thing I've really done extra is made sure I've got rid of that A. Back to the same thing, the E minor over B. do the downward A minor chord there as well. So actually you can see that there, this is one piece where there's very little difference in the way I'm playing it between the two harps. That isn't always the case. There are tunes that definitely I, I play on the wire or I don't play on the gut and very much vice versa. There's tunes I play on the gut that I don't play on the wire. And then there's the way to think about it as well. So sometimes tunes choose their harp and there's a harp they want to be played on but some tunes I just find I like playing them on, on both types of strings and exploring those different sound worlds. And that all helps me come to my decisions, if you like, about how I'm going to play the tune and express it and exactly what sort of grace notes and, and feeling and things I want to uh, put in at any one time as I'm playing, because it's very much that you're, you're informed by all the different harps that you play and all the different techniques that you, you've you learned and you hear and just experiment with them and have fun putting them all together. So I hope this has been a useful episode this week, taking a tune that you've, hopefully, I don't think you'll have heard this before, a couple of people, I think I have, when I first found this tune, I think I maybe taught it in a couple of workshops, but I, the handful of people and it's certainly it's not a tune that I've ever heard anyone else play so I thought this would be quite a good thing to to take a tune from an old collection and look at getting to know the tune starting to see where you might put grace notes in how you might build your ornamentation because you want to play the tune at least two or three times and how, how can you do that and how can you do that on on either and indeed both the wire and the gut strung harps uh, 
Yeah, so thank you very much for following along. There is going to be another two episodes in this series. And later on in the summer, there's probably no absolute promises, but the plan is that the plan was to do it last summer to, to film a series of workshops teaching tunes from the older collections, and Angus Fraser was, is, was going to be one of those. But unfortunately, I, I broke a bone in my leg and, and had it in a, in a big moon boot last summer, so there really just wasn't much opportunity to do much filming, I'm afraid. So hopefully that can happen this summer if you're interested in tunes from the old collections and I, I really hope you are. Please do go to my website and check things out. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that already. It really helps me actually to have to have numbers on the channel if I'm ever trying to apply for funding for, for more things like this. Uh, they always look and see how many people are subscribed. But it also helps you and that you'll get notification of when I'm putting videos up, whether it's performance videos, and I've got a few of those that I do need to get edited down and put up for you. If you can go to my website and download the sheet music, that would be great as well. That's much appreciated. It helps me uh, keep going with this and get, get a bit of payment for my time, which means I can carry on doing things. I'd also really like to, to thank the UKHA, the United Kingdom Harp Association. I got a small grant from them, which helped me buy some of the equipment that I needed to do this here. And also from TASCA, the traditional small arts grant here in Scotland, which also gave me a bit of help to, to let me spend a bit of time on these videos doing them. But uh, any support from yourselves is also much appreciated because I, uh, I've spent a lot of time on these and I've really enjoyed it and it's been good and it's made me realise I'd like to do more so a bit of support for that if you're enjoying these videos would be much appreciated and yeah see you in two weeks time hopefully.